Networking for mutual benefit. It's uh, been the foundation of everything that I teach. Uh, I've spent uh, a lot of times doing as a career coach. I'm a business consultant, and it's a huge part of how I grow my own business, networking for mutual benefit. So you probably know, and I'm, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. You probably know a little bit about me because hopefully you guys did not show up to a conversation with a stranger without going to LinkedIn to figure out who the guy is. Or maybe you looked on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or Tinder or Bumble just to get an idea who I am. But I'll share with you a little bit that I've been doing social networking since 2007. And in 2009, I just start, decided to start a business teaching LinkedIn as a business tool. Uh, for years, I drove all over North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, um, networking, 30,000 miles a year. And a huge part of that was networking. Sounds like a huge expense. Sounds like a, a, a whole lot of work. And that is true. It was. But the benefits were and continue to be immense. Uh, I experiment with social media regularly as I teach people how to use it. You, you just Google TL Burris, double R, double S, and strap in. It's going to be a heck of a ride. Here's my big spaces where I'm on. Ah, not so much Twitter and Facebook anymore, but the rest of them, I'm all over it. Networking for mutual benefit. It's and, and this is the uh, it's networking. It's finding people who can help you in your business and career. Networking is connecting with people you can help. Networking is developing relationships, not just freaking collecting business cards, which is what a lot of people think networking is. Networking is about nurturing relationships so that. When you have a need, you have a relationship. Networking is all about us helping each other. One day when I was preparing to write the book, Networking for Mutual Benefit, I, I had a, I used to have a big four by eight whiteboard behind me and I just kept writing networking, networking, mutual benefit. I did a word cloud of all the words related to networking, you know, people, relationships, connecting, nurturing, developing. Uh, I just kept writing it and I just kept squeezing it and squeezing it. And I, I can't remember what word I changed. I think I took the word is and, and I, I put the word is in there instead of another word. And then it resonated with me. And I do, not, I do not need to read it to know it because it's an edict that I live by. Networking is finding, developing, and nurturing relationships that mutually move people forward through life. There's nothing in there about asking for a job. There's nothing in there about selling your widget. It's about humans helping humans. And, and when I wrote it, and read it, I got goosebumps, and and I knew that this this is my mantra that I need to live by. And then I went and wrote the book. So let's talk about some tactics. And again, uh, raise your hand, oh, unmute, use chat, ask me any questions, and, and I'll, I'm happy to help you in every, any way I can. Top ten ideas. Oh, I left the I left the light bulb in there. That's okay. Still a light bulb moment. Start where you are. People, they start networking and they start using LinkedIn and, and they start, you know, going out and, and they want to go meet all the new people. And what they fail to do is to get into conversations with people whom they already know. That's where it starts. You, you, you in, in, in the, the most, the most powerful tactic is to start where you are. And then, you, well, I don't think my friends know anybody. Well, you just use the words, I don't think, and which tells me you you haven't experienced it. People say to me, well, my mother doesn't know anybody. Bluntly responded, bull. You know, my uncle doesn't know anybody. My brother doesn't know anybody. You don't know who they know that you don't know yet. Start where you are.
They have ideas you should consider. They know people you don't know. You just haven't had that conversation with them yet. And you don't know, my edict about this is you don't know who they know until you talk with them. Number two. This one here is pretty cool. The dude by the name of Keith Ferrazzi who wrote the book, Never Eat Alone. Keith Ferrazzi wrote the book, Never Eat Alone. In the book, one of the chapters was about your weak ties. And your weak ties, these are people who um, at some point in your life, you trusted, respected, liked, or loved them. But, but you haven't talked with them in a while. You, and thus, you don't know what their world is all about today. You don't know who they know today that you may need to know. You don't know um, how they could possibly help you or how you could possibly help them. Her name is Lisa Akers. Lisa and I worked together back in 19 aught never you never you mind. It was before 2000. It was before crap. It was it was the early 1990s, late 1980s. She and I were young. She, we were both recently married. I had children. She was her and her husband were talking about having children. We were both starting this journey into the world of technology. We sat together for years and worked on projects together. She was a salesperson. I was a software uh, and tech, uh, hardware IT consultant. And we were really good friends. Me, uh, Lisa, Eric, Ginger, working for a dude named Carmine. And then I went off and started another job and moved on and she moved on and I, I lost track of Lisa before 2000. In 2020 or 2019, somewhere around there, her name popped up. I'm like, oh my golly, Lisa owns a consulting business in DC. So I looked her up on LinkedIn, sent her a LinkedIn invite. She responded back, oh my God, Teddy, where, where are you? So I sent her my phone number. We called. We talked for 20 minutes. I discovered more about her. She discovered more about me, and she discovered she needed me. So she hired me to do some work for her. I didn't reach out to Lisa to sell my services. I reached out to my weak tie to say hello. And by the way, I do that on a regular basis. I try hard to look back and find people from my past who I trusted, tr respected, and liked, or in with some reciprocal relationship, and I just reach out to say hello. You don't know who they know that you need to know. There are two questions you want to be very purposeful about asking when you're networking. What could I do to help you? And who do you know that I need to meet? Or who do you know that you think I should meet next? You, you've always got to remind yourself, it's sort of like your morning ritual when you get out of bed. There are certain things that you do every freaking morning when you get out of bed. Uh, there are certain things you do every time you get in your car. You know, you get in your car, do you start the car first or put your seatbelt on first? Or do you put your seatbelt on and start the car? I don't care. There are t steps that you do in those rituals. There should be things that you do that are a part of your networking. And I believe they are first and foremost to make sure that person knows that I'm here to help them if I can. Additionally, when I believe I have permission, and you'll know that, you'll feel it, you'll hear it, you'll see it, I also want to uh, ask them, who else do you know that I should meet next? These are core parts of networking for mutual benefit. Never ask for something you don't believe they can provide. Never ask for a job. I think it's the worst thing in the world you can do to anyone is say, do you know about a job for me? No, they don't know about a job for you. They're not your agent. Now, 
maybe they know about a job that, you know, maybe they work for a company that has jobs, but never ask for a job unless you're absolutely clear that that person has a job requisition, a job description on their desk that they're trying to fill. And you shouldn't ask about it. You should say to that person, I'm going to use your names in these conversations. You should say, Charles, I know daggone well that, you know, Charles Inc. is trying to fill a role for X. Can we talk about that? You are more likely to get into that conversation with that tactic than to say to Charles, dude, will you hire me? Ask for conversations about things that are relevant. Never ask for a job. Unless you're absolutely clear that Charles has that job and he's sitting there ready to offer it to you, and that's usually not the case. Number four, introductions. This happens all the time. People, that they're out there, they're, they're sending cold uh, emails, they're doing cold calling, they're sending out cold LinkedIn invites to people who don't freaking know you any better than they know, uh, uh, what's the name, uh, the, uh, uh, the guy's house cat, you know, uh, you know, I can't remember the line, but, you know, they don't know you. They don't know anything about you. But yet you're sending them cold emails, cold calls, and cold LinkedIn invites. And then you're using a tactic that so many people use called hope and prayer. Don't misunderstand me. I believe in hope and prayer. And I think it applies to everything. Lots of stuff I do in life. But it does not apply to business tactics. If you want to have a conversation with the hiring manager, don't send him a cold LinkedIn invite. And most definitely don't send him an invite and go, hey, I want to talk about you hiring me. If you want to have a conversation with a hiring manager, ask for a conversation. And the most powerful way to ask for a conversation is to get someone to first, hang on a minute, Chris, get someone to first introduce you. So that's why you use LinkedIn and why you build a rich network so that you can look and see those who those second level connections are. And when you see that Marianne knows someone you need to talk with, or you see that Charles knows someone you need to talk with, or Chris, then you can say, hey, Chris, will you introduce me to this person? Ask for introductions versus sending out link code, LinkedIn invites, email, et cetera. Chris, unmute. You have a question? Star six on your phone. Can you guys? Yep, got you. Oh, okay. Can you guys, can you guys hear me now? Yes, sir. Awesome. So I recently entered the job market because I'm a, I was on the bad side of downsizing. <clears throat> so I'm going around my per professional network and I'm the people I've known and worked with in the past in their companies and i see these company the, the company um putting on linkedin uh well links to jobs and then i'm just approaching these uh colleagues former colleagues and people i've done business with and i just i said hey you know here's a link i see it in your company i think it's a pretty good fit for me what do you think and would you be willing to have a networking call with me so we can talk it over is that a good approach teddy or is that with, too, with, um oh, chris i love it I love that style. As long as the people you're asking for those conversations trust and respect you well enough to want to have that chat with you. Yeah. 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 Okay. If, if you know them well enough, man, that's great. Let's do a collaborate. Let's, you know, do a, 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 I hate the phrase brainstorming. Let's do a brainstorming conversation about who's trying to hire for this position, what the position is all about, and what you think my tactics should be to get that conversation. I, I love the idea, Chris. Yeah, it's it's I don't know who's behind these uh, job roles, but I'm try. it's like that, you know, two degrees of separation approach. Yeah. You know, I don't know exactly who it is, but I know some people that can lead me down that trail. So that's, good, good that's stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, okay, it's, a, it's a slow journey, but I, I, I know firsthand from my own experience that it's a much more rewarding journey, because here's the other thing. You may ask that dude for a conversation. You may ask that dude or that person for an introduction and they may go, oh, my golly, no. This has happened to me numerous times. I say, will you introduce me to the sales leader? No, I'm going to introduce you to the president of the company. That is far more rewarding than sending that guy a cold email and hoping and praying.
Number five. We get invites to connect on LinkedIn all the time. They're getting uglier and uglier, by the way. And so I'm very purposeful about who I will accept a connection with. However, if any one of you uh, were to tell someone, you need to meet this dude named Teddy. Now, I'm not going to remember all of your names. But if 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 you send me uh, an email, and in the email you go, hey, Teddy, it's Deborah Lee um, you know, from PSG. CNJ, um, I, I have somebody I want you to meet. I think you can help that person. I will absolutely accept that introduction and I will have that conversation to whatever degree I want to manage with that other person. Doesn't mean I'm going to have an hour chat. Doesn't mean a 30 minute chat. Doesn't even mean I'm going to have a 15 minute chat. But if someone says, I want you to help this person do what you can do within the constraints of your world, at the very least for me, it's an email engagement. It may be more than that, but do something. The worst thing you can do to your network is to ignore them when they are asking you for help or asking you to help another. Um, I may repeat this philosophy further in the in the conversation is called karma uh call it life call it god call it buddha call it whatever you want to call it the more you give the more the freaking phone rings and i can tell you right now that my wife and i can look back at our pnl and know when we were not doing that i'm gonna repeat we can look at our pnl profit and law statement, and know when I wasn't giving enough. So I'm pretty deliberate about this. Help those that you can help. Okay, I get it. Pandemic. Um, it got really tough. So that's why I have I'm auctioning off four boxes of business cards for anybody who wants to buy four freshly minted, never been used business cards. However, to, we're, we're, we're slowly getting back, maybe not so slowly anymore, but we are getting back into the world of networking where we meet humans and we press flesh. So do you have a business card process? You have to. Otherwise, all you end up doing is what I've seen firsthand where I ask the, the, the owner of this organization, you, I know you network every day. I know you're at meetings every day. I know you collect business cards. What do you do with them? And he opened up his bottom right-hand drawer and it was full of business cards. And I said, good golly, man, that's a horrible place to put business cards. I said, what do you do with them? He goes, well, that's only a small piece of me. He opened up the bottom left drawer and it was equally full of business cards. And I'm like, that's such a missed opportunity. You need to have a process for managing your business cards. You need to make sure that you're doing something with them so you don't lose track of them. Every business card I get goes into my personal contacts. Why? Because I made personal contact with this person. Every business card I go, I have, I consider, does it go to business contacts or not? If so, I put it in my business contacts. Then I go look for them on LinkedIn. And then I message them and I follow through. Not follow up. I follow through on the conversations. Have a business card process that you manage and by the way, so for as you guys, I can see most of you are not my age. Every co uh, contact I put in, I remind myself where I met Chris. Where did I meet Dwayne? Where did I meet Deborah Lee? So I don't forget it. Where and when. Have a process. Use social media to stare away. A stare. Stare away. To stay aware of your network. Maybe it's for LinkedIn. You pay, you follow those who are important. Ring the bell of those who are important. Maybe it's Instagram. Maybe it's Facebook. Maybe it's Threads. Not for me. Quora, YouTube. But connect with the people who are important to you where it makes sense for you to connect with them. 
and pay attention. Pay attention to birthdays. If someone who's really important to you has a birthday, don't you think they would be somewhat appreciative of you sending them a real, not an automated or AI or scripted, but a real note that says, dude, man, I'm so happy for you. I hope you have a fabulous day. One sec. Do uh, pay attention. Someone has a career shift. Pay attention. They'll be appreciative of you paying attention to them. And by the way, staying aware and creating appreciation, listen to these words, creates an opportunity for a conversation. So look for ways to be able to start a conversation by paying attention to your network. And you don't need to be a freak about it. You don't need to be an addict about it. You don't need to, you know, be staring at the screen all day long, looking for a tiniest little nugget. Just simply pay attention. Number eight. Behind me, you may or may not be able to read the words that are above my head. The words above my head state it all starts with a conversation. That's called engagement. Be willing to get into conversations, however you can, in different ways. It doesn't need to be the same way every time, but you want to look for opportunities to get into conversations with the people who are important to you, the people who can, who can help you. And maybe it's email, phone, text, social messaging. Maybe it's in real life. I don't care. They do. I have a really good friend of mine who is now a client. I can't email her. I, I can't call her. I, I can't go see her because she's across the globe. But if I send her a text message, she's Johnny on the spot responding. That is her preferred channel. And once you discover what their preferred channel is, use it and engage with them. I'm not saying use these channels to pester people, bother people, or ask people for anything. I'm saying to get into conversations with them that are relevant and important to them. The dude's name is Dale Carnegie. He's been dead for many years, but every day he speaks to me. And one of the things he said is to be willing to get into a conversation with the other person about something that's important to them. Be willing to get into conversations. And again, 99% of the conversation should not be about you and what your needs are. It should be about the other person. And, and by the way, if, if you're sitting there and you're like, the guy's name was Alan Helms. Alan Helms was the IT director or the CIO of a large organization in Greensboro, North Carolina, that my old boss in a previous, previous, previous life wanted me to sell our stuff to. He told me every freaking week, he'd say, do you get a hold of Alan? No, email him again, call him again, send him a letter again, over and over and over again. He kept saying, bang on his door, bang on his door, bang on his door, email, phone, text, bang on his door in person. And by the way, banging on his door in his, his, his building, there was a sign that says no solicitations. And if you didn't have a meeting, you couldn't come in, in this door. So it was a waste of time to do that. But every week, my boss told me, call him again, email him again, call him again, email him again. I never heard from Alan Helms. And there's a big story behind that, but that doesn't work. So don't use these channels to pester. Use these channels to have conversations. Um, Chris wrote, it's interesting about social media boards and how different industries are represented them. For example, stare and compare the job postings present on LinkedIn. Yeah, all organizations use them differently. And that's why you need to pay attention to what's the best channel for you and to have a conversation with that person. In the context of helping, Look for ways to help your network. Look, um, negotiations, negotiations. So um, Jason, and I can't remember the other lady's name, 
But I met a lady um, in the UK who has a really powerful brand about contract negotiations. And I got a good buddy of mine named Jason who has been uh, been involved in negotiation work for years and now is writing a book, creating a YouTube channel, and it's hitting the street as a public speaker about negotiations and how to negotiate in and for personal use and corporate use. I'm getting him to teach me how to negotiate with my wife because I want to buy another tool to make more sawdust. And that other tool is 1500 bucks. I really don't believe she's going to let me do it. Jason said, don't ask until you and I talk about uh, how you should negotiate getting that $1,500 tool. But anyway, I meet this lady and I immediately think she needs to know Jason. So I scripted an email together to her and to Jason and I said, look, you two need to talk. Jason sends me a text message. Oh, my God, man. I've been following her for years. She's fabulous. And now I get to talk with her? I didn't know she was a celebrity in that space. I just knew her as a human that plays in that sandbox. She sends me a message back and goes, oh, my God, Jason is so cool. Thank you for introducing me. Now, look. I don't do this first and foremost for the personal reward. But I do this, call it life, God, farmer, or whatever you want, because it makes stuff happen. It's called giving. I don't do it to get, but I know when I do it, I do get. Don't hesitate introducing your network to each other. <laughs> it seems like more and more today, every time someone reaches out to me, all they want is a one. All they want is what they want. Used to, um, I used to go to a networking event in downtown Winston-Salem in a beautiful place friend of mine owned the event, um, Venture Cafe was the name of the group. Really cool place to hang out. Karen Barnes. Karen literally lives right down the street from me. I did not know that. And so now, every now and then, when I go walking, I text her. And I'm like, I want to say hi to your dogs. And sure enough, she'll come out of the porch. She knows I'm walking. She'll come out of the porch with her dogs, and I'll sit on her porch and just talk with her. But anyway, that's a, a side of, uh, of um, which I'll remind me to talk about your circles and I'll tell you about that. Um, but anyway, I go to this networking event and, and some of you have probably done this as well. You go to a networking event and the you, you see these people walk in the, into the building and they're carrying boxes of business cards that they bought from me because I don't need them anymore or our brochures or flyers or coupons. And they walk around the room and they hand out their stuff. True story. I was standing up in a networking event, talking to some people. And from behind me, my hand was just in the right position. And just from behind me, this woman slides a brochure into my hand from behind me. I looked at it and I, I saw the cover. I knew exactly who it was. And I turned to her and I said, I think you dropped this. And she goes, no, I want you to have it. And I said, why? Because my boss told me to hand them out. You, you've been at networking events where you know that when that person walks in the room, they're going to come up to you and tell you about their business, their widget their greatest thing since sliced bread. You know that they're walking in to sell. And you start turning your back to them as they start coming in. Don't be that person. Don't be that person in real life. Don't be that person on, on Zoom calls. Don't be that person uh, on an email, text message, LinkedIn messaging. Because the moment they know your primary purpose is to sell, and by the way, job search is sales, the moment they know you're showing up because you have a need, they're going to start ignoring you. Don't let that happen to you. It won't work. Instead, be like Bill Porter. Bill Porter 
is now a personal friend of mine who I go visiting in a nursing home, assisted living. And the reason why I go visit Bill is because he's full of stories. When Bill networks, he brings stories. He brings interesting stories. He also comes, like Nigel Alston, my Dale Carnegie coach, they both show up and they ask questions. The stories about stuff that's fun, community, life, and they ask questions about you. What's going on? How are you doing? Nigel Alston used to say, when are you writing the book, Teddy? When's the book going to be done, Teddy? When's the book going to be done, Teddy? But Nigel also asked about my wife, who he knows her grandma name is Bum. He'd ask about my grandkids, who he knows I call the grand wee wops. He asked questions. Be that person when you're networking. And you will find that people will eagerly be looking at the door, waiting for you to show up and willing to get into our conversation with you, eager to get into our conversation with you. Look at this list, all, all eyeballs on screen. Dale Carnegie says, never criticize, condemn, or complain. My wife calls it the three C's. She'll say, you're violating the three C's. And you can imagine what, uh, the stuff that I would say that she would snap back at me with those. Don't be that person. Honest, sincere appreciation. Yasser Youssef was a boss for me, uh, one of my bosses for about four years. And when I started working directly for him and we would meet and have a conversation, he would always walk me out to the lobby. Walk me out to the lobby, not go see you later, Teddy. And as we were walking out to the lobby, as, as I'm preparing to leave, he would say, Teddy, I appreciate you. Not I appreciate what you did. Not I appreciate the, the growth of the business or whatever the success was or whatever I did. I appreciate you. That's a much more powerful way to think and to engage with someone. Arouse in that other person an eager want for them to get involved, for them to participate, for them to share. I call it for them to peel back extra layers and be willing to tell you more without doing TMI. Be generally interested in that person. When you're talking with someone on a Zoom call, or you're talking to someone in person, face them. Don't stand as if you're preparing to leave, but face them face to face. Look at the camera. Now I got you over here on the left. So I got my presentation in front. So every now and then I got to look over here to, to see if, if Mary Ann's rolling her eyes at me or not. And she's not. But if I really want to talk with you, I'm talking to the dot. That's how you show that you're interested. When they're talking, you're looking at them. Smile. The smile is powerful. And you can do that on Zoom. You can do that in person. You can do that with the words that you write in messaging. Think about the words that you write. And remember to Eileen and to Gail and James and to Lee and to Lisa and to Michael and Mike and Nick and Peter and Scott, who's on here twice. I wonder what kind of a personality this guy has. It's got to be interesting. But remember to all of us, our names are the sweetest and most important sound in any language. And Teddy adds comma or font. Comma or font. Use the other person's name in the conversation, which, by the way, will help you to remember these people's names so that I never get embarrassed like I was embarrassed with Deborah Marshall in front of her mother who had Alzheimer's and remembered her daughter's name and I couldn't be a good listener. Don't listen enough to where you can uh, 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 try to get a word in edgewise with what you're thinking before they even complete what they say. And encourage them, others, to talk about themselves. 
Talk in terms of what's important to them. You don't care about SEO. You don't care about click to bait. You don't care about CPMs. You don't care about, you know, uh, algorithms. So why do I want to talk about that stuff that's important to my business to you? I should be talking with you. I hate the phrase to you. I should be talking with you in terms of what's important and of interest to you. And by the way, as our relationships grow, you're going to start asking me about that weird stuff where relevant appropriate. Make the other person feel important. There's lots of dynamics to that, whatever it is and whatever context. But when you make the other person feel important, your level of trust and respect is going to factorially go up and do it sincerely. Oh, this is the, this is the story. My most important asset in my life. Well, before I tell you what it is, I'll tell you what it's not. It's not my $63 million that I think I have in my big buckets, which I clearly do not have. I tell my daughters that I have a huge buckets for uh, of investment, huge buckets of investments. Now, you, you got to have a ladder to get down there and get the nickels out of it. I got a house. I got a car. I got a computer. I have a CNC machine. You know, I have a bunch of other woodworking tools. Those are good stuff. That's important stuff. But none of those things. None of those materialistic things are my most important asset in my life. My most important asset in my life is my network. And this is made up of three primary categories in my dynamic. My friends and family. I have four daughters. I have four son-in-laws. I have 12 grandkids. I have uh, a bunch of nephews and nieces. And I got, hey, by the way, listen to this. I got 13 brothers and sisters, okay? I got neighbors across the street are good buddy. I got three other fantastic buddies that I travel all over the country with. That's my friends and family. That's important to me. I also have my business and career connections. I have my clients, my business partners. I have people I used to work with. I have the whole network of people that I, I've worked with and or work with today. I also have my civic community. You know, PSG CNJ is a part of that civic community where I show up and help. March of Dimes is important to me. Senior services is important to me. Um, um, my churches, my synagogues, the, the, wherever you hang out for that spiritual world can be important to you. These are your networks. What, what makes those networks powerful is when they overlap. When you're when the people you do business with and hang out with in your communities become friends, when your family and your friends become in some context or another related to your business or your civic group, when they overlap, that sweet spot that I call a great life is when your network has a powerful impact. Let me say this again: when your network has a powerful impact on your life which would mean that you also have a powerful impact on their lives. That is my most important asset in my life. And I offer to you, it could be, if it is not already, a critical, potentially most important asset in your life. Damn, I'm good with time today. Networking is finding, developing, and nurturing relationships that mutually move people forward through life. And done right can help you uncover the job, not a job, the job that you are trying to uncover. Uh. Read Never Eat Alone. Read How to Win Friends and Influence People. And I just basically read for you networking for mutual benefit. 